Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 2012, Super Bowl Sunday. Alan, you probably remember this day. It was a Ravens game. So Super Bowl on 2012 started with the anticipation of almost any other Super Bowl. With all the lights, all the hype, all the commercials and no expense spared. And with the opening kickoff, the game was underway, and before long, the lights went out. And the game came to a screeching halt as if someone had pulled the plug on everything. It's been dubbed as the Blackout Bowl, but that kind of, that kind of play-halting event is exactly what Jesus does in our gospel text this morning. By driving out the animals that were to be used for the gospel, by, by turning over the money changers' tables, the temple activity came to a halt, came to a standstill. People who were really even by law and faithfully coming to change money and make sacrifice, they couldn't do either of those things. And it always begs the question when we hear this text, why is Jesus so angry? Well, in the synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Luke, Matthew Mark, and Luke, he is angry. He's coming and he's protesting the temple system. But in John, which is where our story comes from this morning, John writes it with a little bit of a different purpose in mind. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the point of no return during Holy Week where these events, this public display, is part of the conflict that makes his crucifixion, his execution, inevitable. This story sets up the crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John, in John, in the context of the gospel, we don't find it anywhere near Holy Week. This actually happens to be in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. So what's going on? What's, what's Jesus angry about, or really in John, is he angry at all? Shortly before this, Jesus had just finished his first public sign, the wedding at Cana turning water into wine, and then now all of a sudden he's at the temple in Jerusalem and he's flipping over tables and he's starting a cattle drive. You see, for John, it's not about anger. For John, it's not about the abuse of the temple system, or at least not just about the abuse of the temple system, like it was in the Synoptic Gospels. There is a different reason for this story, for the cleansing of the temple story in the Gospel of John. It serves to tell us, it serves to remind us of where the presence of God resides. Or, especially for John, maybe to even reinterpret where the presence of God actually is. You see, for the Jews in Jesus' day, it was, of course, the temple. Tradition told them that God lived in the Holy of Holies in the very center room of the temple. And so the place that all of the faithful Jews came in order to offer appropriate sacrifice was the temple. But Jesus, in John's gospel, is making the claim right here, right in the second chapter, right at the beginning of his public ministry, 
that it's no longer the temple building that they should come to, but the temple is his own body, that the fullness of God is in him, (coughs) that he is the appropriate and the right place for worship. Throughout scripture, even when you think back to the Old Testament, God's place has been with God's people. Wherever they happen to go, even when they're carried into exile, God doesn't leave them. John's gospel is about a similar theology and faith. It's not about the timeline, necessarily. From the very beginning of John, we hear the word became flesh, that Jesus became flesh and lived among us. (coughs) And so this particular story occurring right in chapter 2, just on the heels of that promise, really means that this story is about God's role with God's people, about Jesus' identity, and about a new interpretation of the proper place to offer worship. If Jesus tells us that God's place is with us, with people, what does that mean? If Jesus is the appropriate place for worship, what does that mean for us? I think as human beings, we still tend to want to relegate Jesus' presence and Jesus' influence to this building, to this particular segment of our life, or this particular group of people when we're all gathered together. It's so easy. It's, It's common for us to do that, and it stands in the way of what God is doing. As if we could place God in a box that is only accessible at a particular place at a particular time. This Lent, we've been talking about what it means to be a people of God's promise. This morning, we are blessed to welcome Riker into our church family in baptism. As we gather around the baptismal font, we'll hear God's promises of forgiveness and new life spoken once again. And as a congregation, we will make promises. Parents make promises. Sponsors will make promises. And God will make promises to Riker this morning. Quick show of hands, how many of you were baptized in this particular baptismal font? Raise them high. Okay, there's a good number. There's a good number. This font has seen thousands of promises made over its lifetime. Our promises to live as God's faithful people, to come to hear the word of God, to share in the Lord's Supper, to learn the basics of the faith, the creed, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and to strive for peace and justice in all the world. In short, to live out our faith daily. This font over the years has meant a lot to a lot of people. Enough so that when the congregation built the new sanctuary in 1993, they brought the font from the old sanctuary to this one. It's a symbol of the congregation's history, but that's not really why it's important. It's important because of what happens. What happens when we gather at those waters. Or more accurately, what God does when we gather at those waters. As disciples, we need to take the events of the font, God's promises of being claimed, being renewed, being forgiven. We need to take those promises with us each and every day out into the world. And remember that it's not the building, it's not even the font that really matters. It's about worshiping God. And we have a God who goes with us and actually even goes before us no matter where we go. No matter how many times we leave this building or our homes, God goes with us. The challenge for us as Christians is to have the same confidence in our proclamation, the same confidence in our witness and in our faith outside these walls as we do when we're gathered here for worship together on Sunday morning. See, because it doesn't matter whether it's camp, whether it's work, school, home, in the car, whether we're meeting new people or engaging in difficult conversations with loved ones. Christ is there. And the way that we speak, the way that we act, the way that we live 
They're an extension of our worship of God. Our everyday proclamation and witness of the gospel is a form of worship. In 1 Corinthians, and I love this passage from 1 Corinthians that we had this morning talking about the foolishness of God. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. I will be the first to tell you that as a preacher, I love that part of the text. Through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. None of our proclamation is perfect. There's not a a pastor's proclamation who does anything, who does everything because it's what God does through those words. In the first chapter of God, of John, we're reminded that God became flesh and lived among us. God continues to live among us today in the working of the Holy Spirit. Our proclamation may not be perfect, but the good news is that our proclamation doesn't need to be. We simply need to remind people or tell them for the very first time about God. And that God isn't just found within these four walls. God isn't contained like that. God isn't just for perfect people. Because let's face it, we know there aren't any. Jesus came, and God is for sinners. For people who are broken and in need of God. People like me and people like you. People aren't perfect. Institutions, even the church, isn't perfect. Luckily, we worship a God who doesn't fit inside one building or box. We worship the God of the universe, the same God who became flesh and continues to live among us. Not just once, not just a long time ago, but today and now in the midst of our lives. Thanks be to God, our God who is always and everywhere. Amen.